సహనాభవతు సహనావతు సహనౌ గునక్తు సహవీర్యం కరవావహై తేజస్వి నావదీతమత్సు మా విద్విషావహై సుస్వాగతం నమస్కార అండ్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఫ్రెండ్స్ ఇట్స్ అవర్ ప్లెషర్ దట్ వీ హ్యావ్ శ్రీ రాజీవ్ మల్హోత్రా విత్ అస్ ఐఎమ్ షూర్ యూ పీపుల్ డోంట్ నీడ్ ఎనీ ఇంట్రొడక్షన్ హౌ ఆర్ ఇట్స్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ ఫార్ మీ టు స్టే అఫ్ యూ వర్డ్స్ I'll just say this, Rajiv Ji is one amongst us, like every other Indian who had the aspirations of knowing what this world is all about. At a young age, after doing his bachelor's at St. Stephen's in Delhi, he went to the US to do his master's in physics. But then, I think he found interesting things happen otherwise in that country, in the US. So he switched over to IT and then grew up in the IT industry. he kind of at a young age of 40 plus was a senior vice president at a company called ITNT and uh, had some very interesting revelations of his own swadharma and decided to go full time into understanding our sanatana dharma understanding the challenges being posed to it and starting to take it head on rajiv ji has been running the infinity foundation with his own resources for the past 25 plus years initially funding academics to do the research to figure out what was happening then finding it a bit inadequate because of the consistency and perseverance that's needed and then he did the interesting thing of saying okay let me write the books right and uh, we are very fortunate to have him amongst us now because we have a very interesting book which you can see here on the banner behind and rajiv ji has been very kind to us in bangalore he is kind of uh, giving a series of talks on a variety of topics that he has addressed in his latest book this book is not yet formally released but then i'm sure he is going to tell you the rest of the story what i'd like to share is rajiv ji's perseverance persistence in understanding the challenges to sanatan dharma and his responses to it and his responses in co-opting us to help him out is what stands out so that note let's all welcome rajiv ji the big round of applause <laughs> so rajiv ji the floor is all yours namaskar it's a pleasure to be here and recognize some familiar faces also yeah nice <coughs> so i'm giving uh, six talks in bangalore and then the seventh is a workshop and then i go to chennai where there is even more congested um uh, right in ray mohan ji thought that maybe two events a day is not enough so we'll do three in chennai so we have uh, more congested itinerary in chennai and then i come back uh, to bangalore for one day and uh, art of living is going to have a big event on the 24th afternoon shri shri ravi shankar will launch the book over there and so it will be huge gathering because of that then i go off to bombay and then andabad and then delhi so there will be uh, 20 to 25 events total so what i decided is that uh, rather than repeating e- each uh, event is has different people so if it's purely a series of lectures with different content then some of you will not know what happened previously you may not understand it on the other hand it's boring for me to keep repeating the same thing every time and it will be just one overview after another overview but i'll never get to go into detail so i had to make a balancing between these two and i decided that each time <coughs> i'll give a little bit of overview so you know the whole thing little bit but then i'll say something different uh, it, so i can move from one part of my book to the next and in these six lectures total uh, i want to discuss 
most of the big ideas in the book, especially at least an, a summary of the big idea. So you can then go read more details because I want people to actually read it, the details. <coughs> so what I want to start with is that this book is basically, while the title is The Battle for Sanskrit, it's not a book that is going to teach you Sanskrit or teach you why it's a great language and so on. It's more about Sanskriti and how it's facing uh, threats from academic people. And these threats are not just very abstract, intellectual, but they turn into political, they turn into human rights movements, they turn into media biases. So what stays in the academy, what starts in the academy doesn't stay in the academy, it gets spread out. And each of my books, I pick a different theme, a different target. So here I pick Indologists, people who are Sanskrit studies experts. These people are very powerful. They're not fools. Don't mix them up with Wendy Doniger. Don't mix them up with missionaries. It's a different, different battle. It's a different battle, different, different data, different arguments. So the idea, the, the way I approach is each book, I pick the main scholars at the very top of a genre or a school of thought. And I take all their works and then I evaluate them objectively and give a response from our side. I'm not attacking anybody personally. I don't want to do that. It trivializes my work because I don't have to work so hard if all I wanted was to keep uh, abusing people. I don't believe in that. So it's a very uh, balanced view. Uh, it respects the other people even though I disagree with them. Uh, there's not, no, not, nothing personal, uh, no personal uh, uh, mudslinging or any of that that I want. <coughs> now, the methodology being used to study Sanskrit, Sanskriti, all the texts of Sanskrit is what I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Why this is something serious for us to take note of. Yeah? Now, I made a list of what are some of the key objections I have and I want to share that with you. Probably the most, there, there is one thing, one major thing they remove from our tradition, which is very important for us, but they remove it. And then they add two things. So if you take something and remove the essence, that's a big distortion. And then you add two things which are damaging, that's further distortion. So I'll tell you what these are. They remove the sacred dimension, secularize it, make it kind of an atheistic text, or make it look like it, the sacredness claimed is not authentic. It is claimed, but it is not really authentic. It is irrational, unscientific, and so on. So the, the Paramarthika, what the Vedas call Paramarthika, the transcendental realm is removed. And what is added are two things. One is that the text is mainly concerned about social oppression, oppression against Dalits, women, these kind of things, minorities. So they're looking for Marxist left-wing uh, idea, you know, that perspective is what they're bringing and looking for social oppression in Vedas, in Ramayana, in all kind of texts, <coughs> even in grammar. And the second thing they're adding is political. They, they are seeing, studying these texts as political weapons by the elite. So they are socially oppressing and they are, the elite want to get political power for themselves using these texts. That's how the Sanskrit tradition is being studied. Now, of course, they're very full of praise they will, to fool people, they will say it's a great language, it's such a beautiful language, we should revive it. And so people talk to call me and say, why are you criticizing me? The guys are so nice. Because our people are easily duped. This morning, I gave a talk at a Sanskrit university. We had 150 scholars, faculty people, PhD people, scholars. 
It was a very, very interesting talk, uh, Q&A and interaction. Then we had a private brainstorm with the top people in a private room. And it's very clear, none of them have properly studied and understood Western Indology. When I asked a big room, has anybody done Purva Paksha of Western Indology? Nobody raised their hand. Then I said, okay, I'm glad nobody has raised their hand because I know that's the case. So we're honest about it. Then one guy raised his hand. I said, good, I'd like to understand more what you've done. Then one more guy raised his hand. So those two out of 150 said they have done some Purva Paksha, which means study of the other, an analysis of your opponent. This is required of our tradition. To be a scholar in the ancient times, you are required to study your opponents in an honest way and then give a response to them. Otherwise, you are not considered properly qualified. You can't say, I know what I, I'm, uh, what I believe. I don't have to worry about what he says. No, you have to worry about what he says. So this escapism today from confronting the other is not what we had in the past. We are very open and direct about uh, examining the other's point of view and giving a strong answer. So the another gentleman, I really appreciated him. He's, he's, one, he's one of the senior Sanskrit scholars in the faculty. He stood up and said, the traditional Sanskrit scholars of India have failed the nation. We have failed our tradition because we haven't done this kind of Purva Paksha. And this is absolutely true. And I'm glad he said it because I was going to say it. And it's better that one of them said it. So why? So it is very interesting that our traditional scholars are afraid. They're not very qualified. They are hiding. And they have given the field over to the Westerners. And they, some of them are on the payroll of the Westerners. A lot of Indian traditional scholars are being funded by the Westerners. Some, they pick the best ones and fund them and take them somewhere brainwash them, send them back. So it's not only Western scholars who are doing these things, but now large army of Indian scholars are joining. They, they are also in the same intellectual wavelength. In the British era, the British were not as active in appropriating Indian minds. There were some, like Ram Mohan Roy got appropriated and a lot of other, you know, Brown Sahib type people. But mainly for administrative jobs in the British system. Intellectual things they controlled. And so what is called Orientalism and Indology was mainly being done in Oxford and you know Germany and so on, hardly much over here. Whereas now the Americans have taken this over and their system is more assimilative. So they've assimilated a lot of Indians and Americanized them and brought their idea of India and their idea of Indology, their idea of Sanskrit into the Indians and had them go back to India and export it. So this is a very dangerous thing going on. Not only do I have to critique and expose Western scholars, but also Indian leftists. But not only that, Hindu activists, Hindu intellectuals, many of them are compromised. They'll talk they're against certain uh, problems that are going on very nicely, very actively, but they haven't really gone deeper and done their investigation. So they end up supporting the wrong guys. They will end up supporting the same kind of people that we should be criticizing. And in this book, I will give you many examples of our people from Narayan Murthy onwards to the Shingeri Mutt to a lot of people who are going around promoting Hinduism and uh, going to conclaves and having workshops and all that, actually being aligned with the wrong side. I don't know if it's deliberate or just ignorance, but it is the case. So uh, my approach is stick to the issue. Stick to an issue. So here is the misinterpretation of Ramayan. This is what's wrong with it. This is what I want to uh, replace it with. This is my response. Here is a wrong interpretation of Vedas. Here is my response. Here is a wrong interpretation of, all, of the history of Sanskrit, of the s relationship of Sanskrit with vernaculars, and here is my response. So we should stick to issues. If, you're, if you take a position which is based on issues, 
then it doesn't matter what the personality of somebody is. He may be a big shot, but if he's on the wrong side, he's on the wrong side. So that is how I'm approaching it. I'm not concerned with, you know, he's a good man and he, he's somebody we should not talk this way. I, I don't care. I'm looking at the issues and if, 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 I, if I'm very convinced of, the, uh, of a, what position we should take on a given issue, then whoever is on the wrong side is on the wrong side. Doesn't matter how powerful he is. This is how we have to, we have to do it. So I will tell you the, the first, tell you a little bit about these areas of bias. The first area is removal of the sacred. Now the removal of the sacred happens in a very subtle way. They keep praising the Vivarika. They keep praising that uh, brilliant poetry, it's beautiful, and things like that. But they've removed the Paramarthika, which is the sacred dimension, the transcendental dimension. When you remove the Paramarthika, you really don't have a, the Vedic Vedas are no longer Shruti. So what you've done is you've turned it into some poetry. And then you have people like this, Dev Lak Patnaik and all kinds of bestsellers, Hindus are love, in love with them, who turn it into mythology. So the, the real purpose of the text is gone and it becomes some kind of pop culture and some kind of, uh, you know, fiction kind of thing. There's a very big industry in India where you turn this into sort of uh, secular or casual entertainment, casual entertainment. Uh, and this is a very serious problem for me because I feel that they're tampering with the sacredness of my, my heritage. Now, there is a term, philology. Philology. How many of you know the term philology? Anybody? Okay, very good. Some people don't. So philology, philology is, it means a systematic study of texts, which means you read a text very systematically. You try to understand, making sense of a text, understanding its meaning, interpreting what it means. So when you take a Gita class and they're trying to tell you what this word means, what that means, so they're doing philology, they're looking at the language, what each of those words means and trying to explain the whole text bit by bit. They are doing a philological analysis. So this philology exists. We have Indian uh, philology, Indian approaches to interpretation would be called Indian philology. We have different philologies in the West. So which system you use will determine what you outcome you get. Okay, so that is philology. Now what Indologists have done is invented another term which they call political philology. Okay, political philology means looking at a text to look for political motives. So when, when somebody is doing this jagna, he must be exploiting. When when somebody is doing Katha of Ramayana, there, there's actually a political motive they're looking for. So they're looking for pol political motive everywhere. Political philology is the uh, study of Indian texts uh, with the idea of finding uh, political exploitation, political uh, misabuse. So political philology is a kind of a, not general philology, it's a particular philology looking for something which is not how we look at our texts. Then another term is called liberation philology. Westerners have invented liberation philology as a methodology to study Sanskrit texts. Liberation philology means we now intervene in the Indian society to liberate them from their own oppression. So political philology is their Purva Paksha of India, Indian texts, Purva Paksha means understanding the other. So their Purva Paksha of the Indian text, they do through political philology. And their Uttar Paksha means response. What is your recipe? What is What do you want to change? That they do through liberation philology. So political philology is I understand you. Liberation philology, now I get in and change you, uh, to liberate you. This is, all this is so sophisticated and abstract. I try to make it very simple in this book. So if you read it, you'll understand things that have taken me a very long time, lot of reading to understand exactly what they are saying and bring it to you in a way that is easily understood by an average person. The problem is our traditional people cannot figure out what they are saying. They cannot figure out head or tail of what they are saying. So rather than learning, upgrading their knowledge and then giving a response, our traditional uh, people have said, we don't care, why should I care, it doesn't matter to me, they're nice people, they come here, they give me some grants, they fly me to USA, look after me, so our people are also bought off. 
So partly it is shame of being ignorant, partly it is uh, inferiority complex, partly it is greed, everybody competing each other to get a little bit ahead. So all of these things in combination have produced, I'm sorry to say, a whole incompetent group, a whole generation of incompetence we have. So then it is easy to be bombastic and stand up and say, oh, we hate this guy, this is emotional. That doesn't help. You cannot, be, you cannot respond to a very serious intellectual work by being emotional outburst, bombastic. That, that is how people overcompensate their ignorance, our people, by being very emotional, okay, out of control emotions. So my work is very serious. And it is very risky because I'm alone. I wish there were many more people doing this, then they, we would all be in company with reinforce support each other. But because I'm alone, they know this guy has to be brought down because he's setting a bad example. And if he prevails and wins enough people, then you know the Western Indologists will be in trouble. They know that. So in this book, I introduced many of my own uh, original new ideas. One of them I call sacred philology which means you guys are studying my culture as a political system of texts. And then you want to liberate it from its sacredness because you consider sacredness to be oppressive, primitive, backward, unscientific. You want to liberate it from all those things. I, on the other hand, do just the opposite. I want to study it using sacred philology, which means the philology, the systematic study, looking for sacredness. So. Our people look for the Vedic text as sacred. We don't look at it as some kind of political system going on, you see. Now, when they study Bible, it is a political system. It's all about Romans. They did this to this Jesus, and then they, this happened. It's all political. And even uh, uh, the Jewish t is, you know, some, they made them into slaves, and they're supposed to. So it is like God, God is playing politics in the world. The whole thing is like that. And similarly, Islam. It's all a political, military conquest running here, there. So they're bringing this kind of an idea on us. And I really don't like it. And this business of liberating us from our own traditions is very dangerous. It's really colonizing us. It says that your tradition no good, I know better, and you know you are stuck in some exploitation. I'm going to liberate you. So this dangerous combination of political philology as the diagnostic tool and liberation philology as the prescribed cure. So political philology will tell you what the disease is, and liberation philology will treat it. This is a very dangerous combination, and my response is that I want our text to be read as, as sacred philology. And they don't, just don't, can't accept this, because I'm putting the control back in the hands of tradition. Problem is, when I say I'm representing the tradition, who? I look behind me, it's empty, nobody's standing there. Yeah, nobody's standing there. It's like this, uh, it's imagine some war, and there is some general in a, in a big tank and uh, something, he's going ahead and conquering those guys, and there's big army behind him, he's so proud. But then when the firing starts, he looks in the back, they all run away. So I feel like that. I feel like a, a let down constantly. And they keep clapping, some, the, some people say, sir, you are so great, nothing will happen to you, go fight. Oh. We'll sit here and clap. We eat our samosa, we're having chai, we're watching. Sir, we're watching you on TV. You're doing good job. So I don't want to be this mascot, this boxing guy who's being encouraged to go fight and take the hits alone. I can't. I need others to join. So who are these others that are going to join me? So the scholars are, our traditional scholars are not up to the mark. But they're very arrogant. Some of them will say, who are you? Some Sanskrit scholars have said, who are you? We, got, we are the scholars. So I say, good, you do the Puru Paksha. I'll sit home now. You do the Puru Paksha. Come back in one year and give me a report. They don't want to take the responsibility, you see? So they have this official position, but they're not really honoring it. They're not really performing like they should. So if we set them aside and we look at common Hindus, they're not doing it. Some of them are not qualified because it's very, very hard work. It's not just a matter of be, uh, making a cut and paste here and there. It's very hard work. You would have to do like me. You'd have to quit doing everything and for a couple of decades just immerse yourself and do this because that's what it would take. And some of them don't have the English language skills. Some of them who have the English language skills are so westernized in their lifestyle. They're sold out. They don't want to. They're more aligned with the West than with our tradition. 
that's a problem we have and then those hindu lead thinkers who are not sold out who have the english skills who understand the problem many of them are looking for quick getting ahead without the tapasya needed to do it properly so they would love to follow me around and use me as a source of uh, information that they can quickly package and put it out somewhere and then keep me out because then i am a dangerous guy to have around because i'll i'll say things that they don't know and it'll embarrass them so it's better that they they don't have me around so this is also these kind of things are not helping our cause it is not helping our cause then you have people in uh, power uh, people in power i don't think that they are serving our tradition they are using the tradition for political getting themselves ahead so uh, media is not really serious about our tradition government hasn't really done a whole lot no government old government new government i mean the new government is better than the old government but brave new moves would have by now been taken to at least understand the problem the diagnostic of the problem have a report saying that's the state of indology i have proposed offered free of charge that i'll produce a report on the state of indology in the world like a mckinsey report on an industry because i used to do industry analysis i used to do industry analysis and i've done this industry analysis about indology for so many years then i stopped doing it because nobody pays any attention so i said i am willing to revive that i have databases i have a lot i mean i i i'll produce this but i i don't want any money and all that i or anything for that except i want an audience i want to make sure the real decision makers will read it understand it appoint uh, some people to study it evaluate it it will become an important discourse and i i, I have no uh, traction you see because um, it's very interesting to that uh, even in the new government a lot of infiltration has happened even in the new establishment because you know the colonial system and the western thinkers are very shrewd savvy they've been around for hundreds of years they know how to infiltrate they know how to penetrate so through one means or another they get their people in the door they come with dan sam dan sam dan we are going to help you we're going to do this and that that sort of not bhed dand that is later so sam dan charitable getting in the door now this is a uh um, this is the situation that i'm facing so i uh, uh after the realization of uh, that the basic goal they have is remove the sacred from our texts in the interpretation and introduce oppression social social and economic and oppression and then politics as the method, as the re- as the reason for these texts to be popular these texts to be uh, popularized that motive they keep insinuating after that i realized next thing i realized is that the um, oral tradition oral tradition is denigrated devalued the, the claim being made by western indologists is that history of sanskrit starts with writing before that is oral but no progress is being made everything is just static people are fixed in the same thing they're repeating they're doing this mechanical yagna and they're chanting these vedas they nobody understands and these clever brahmins want to keep it secret they don't write it down because if it's secret they can exploit people nobody understands what they're doing it's some kind of magic and they've convinced people this magic is necessary for social good for keeping the order so everybody is obeying them it's a system of exploitation and buddhists come and attack the vedas which is not really true but that's their theory and they buddhists then start writing for the first time so according to them writing in india is, is invented by buddhists and when buddhists start write their goal for writing is that they want to make it democratic they want to make the right material available to everybody so they start writing and then the vedic brahmins also cap- copy from the buddhist start writing so sanskrit written down is a ba- vedic invention which the hindus copied from them that's the theory and so the whole history of when valmiki wrote ramayan is changed valmiki according to them wrote ramayan 200 years after buddha so the ancient nature of ramayan is finished it's not there very recent dates are added this uh, the the devaluation and sidelining the oral evidence is a very convenient thing for them 
because they could not make such claims if you have to look at the oral evidence. Because the oral evidence shows that uh, Sanskrit has been evolving, it's not fixed. New grammar has been developed, the old grammar has been evolving, mathematics, astronomy have been evolving. So one way not to take that evidence into consideration is to just say we don't consider oral evidence, it's not reliable. So this is a, uh, this, this devaluation of the oral is a very serious problem for me in the Western Indology. Another very major problem is they, they find the Shastra as a category, not any one Shastra in particular, but Shastras in general to be, uh, wrong, to be, to be a, the wrong thing to revive. They keep saying that Shastras are so close to Vedic that they are really propagating the Vedic abusiveness in another way. So all the Shastras are reflecting Vedic metaphysics and since Vedic metaphysics is a hierarchy, social oppression, all of that continues in the, through the Shastras also. Shastras transmit the Vedic poison, toxic, what is toxic in the Vedas gets transmitted through the Shastras. So there's also a, a problem with Shastras according to a lot of Western Indologists and I have a whole chapter, a whole large number of pages on showing what exactly their argument is and giving my response to that. Then there is this whole critique of Kavya, poetics. Uh, their critique of Kavya is that Kavya is also, is mainly a political device used by kings to show off their greatness. They hire Brahmins to write how great the king is, Prashastis, and so these Prashastis are basically Brahmin sponsored by king to praise the king so that the public will think king is great. And so it's a Brahmin and king conspiracy to exploit the people. All the Marxist thinking, class struggle, Marxist thinking. So uh, this whole business of uh, how uh, language is, the Sanskrit language is very sophisticated and the poetics are very sophisticated makes Indians very happy. But what they're really saying is it's sophisticated as a system of exploitation. It's a, it's a sophisticated system of making a fool out of you. That's what they're, how, that's the reason Sanskrit, Sanskrit is so great according to them. So this also uh, I, is an issue that I oppose very seriously in my book. Then there is a whole chapter I have on uh, the relationship between Sanskrit and vernaculars. This, the, my theory is that the re it's a relationship of harmony Sanskrit br brought formal structure and vernaculars are free, experimental, evolving, new things happening uh, and the two are feeding knowledge back and forth. Sanskrit words are being adopted into the vernaculars. Vernaculars introduce words that become Sanskritized. So this has been a uh, back and forth thing. But the Western Indologists say that Sanskrit is sort of uh, aggressive, dominating, controlling, uh, bossing over the vernaculars. It's invading, it's kind of a oppressive system. And uh, it's an elitism. It, it's the, the Sanskrit was controlled by the elitists and the vernaculars are for the masses. So again, it's a Marxist class struggle idea being brought in. And they also believe the Sanskrit is an Aryan foreign thing. So then uh, a whole chapter I have on Ramayan. The Ramayan is, uh, mischaracterized and distorted in the Western Indologies big, big way, big way. One of the most uh, ridiculous claims is that Ramayan was unpopular, was not a big thing in the public imagination until the Muslims invaded and then the Hindu kings needed something to unite the public against the Muslims. So they thought, the, they, they dreamt up this Ramayan as a great tool to uh, hit out at the Muslims by calling them Rakshasas. So this idea that the king is divine and the demonic other has to be killed for the sake of public harmony gets projected onto the Muslims. This is the theory that they have. It's a very dangerous commune. I think this is communal communalism. If we say something like that, we would be called communal. But this is what the Western Indologists have dreamt up, that the Ramayan is to be accused as a system of anti-Muslim rabble rousing for a thousand years. And so these people who are writing all this say that uh, what they did in Ayodhya, what these Hindus did is not a surprise because that's the way Ramayana has been used for a very long time. So um, this, um, um, 
popularity of Ramayana across Southeast Asia, every, uh, wherever you know, Indian influence has been, is explained as uh, kind of the kings want to popularize Ramayana because then the king looks like he's divine. He's like Ram. He's, he's divine. And it's a way to make himself you know, be accepted by the public as somebody divine. So Brahmins are fed and sponsored by the king so that because the Brahmin is the one who's going to make the king look divine and make the king look superior. So the king sponsors the Brahmin and the Brahmin writes all this stuff and promotes the Ramayana and does yagnas to make the king very powerful. And so it's a, again a collaboration <laughs> between the king as an elite and the Brahmins as an elite to support each other. So it's a franchise with king and uh, Brahmin being the co-conspirators, if you will, and they keep spreading this all over Southeast Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. So Ramayana is sort of a device to do that. This, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, I, I did a whole chapter on Ramayana, how the West, West sees Ramayana as a case study. And then I show how this kind of idea of Ramayana has entered movies, it has entered school textbooks. Now there is a TV serial uh, Devdath Patnaik is doing, uh, 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 you know, in, in India, uh, where basically these kind of ideas are there. So um, what starts in the academy doesn't stay in the academy. It enters in public life. And uh, look at the Aryan theory we are having to live with, the Dravidianization of politics we are having to live with. It all started in Indology. When people say, how does it matter? Well, it matters because uh, these things you can trace back until Max Miller, nobody had no, and, and uh, a few other people, yeah, Robert Caldwell, until these two jokers in the mid 1800s, nobody had uh, in India for thousands of years, there's no such thing as a consciousness of we are Dramitian and we are Aryan or vice versa. There is no text talking like that in India. Suddenly these Western Indologists take our texts, give different spin and come out with this. And today we are having to live with it. Similarly, the caste system is a distortion from Varna and Jati. So that too also is a big problem we are living with. It's the product of Western Indology. So you cannot say that this Western Indology is just some theoretical thing for a few professors, sir, why are we worrying? We have to worry. These things are uh, rapidly uh, entering the minds of our so society in a very systematic and aggressive way. Now, there is also a claim that Sanskrit had racism which taught racism to the Europeans. That they picked up racism from Sanskrit. That the, when we blame the colonialists, we shouldn't blame the colonialists because when they came to India, they studied all this Sanskrit and they picked up these ideas. And the Germans picked up these ideas and started Holocaust on the Jews, but the German picked up these ideas from Sanskrit. There's a very famous paper called Deep Orientalism. Orientalism is this, uh, how the uh, Western scholars, Indologists have stereotyped the Orient, the Asian stuff. And Orientalism is accused of being sort of racist. So the response from the Western Indologists is that yes, it is racist. We agree, it's bad. But it became racist because of their study of Sanskrit. So they picked up these bad habits from Sanskrit. So again, we are being blamed even for the racism that we are subjected to. That this racism that we are subjected to is because in Sanskrit, the Brahmins were doing these things already for a long time, and they learned it from us. So again, ridiculous things, but very senior professors, powerful people, rewarded by our government writing these kind of things. So um, then there is a very cl uh, audacious claim called the death of Sanskrit which says Sanskrit has been dead for a thousand years. Hindu kings killed it. Hindu kings killed it. Muslims try to help, but they would, Hindu kings would not get their help. And they give some example here, maybe a sultan somewhere or somebody was uh, actually sponsoring and helping Sanskrit as though that's a true fact, you know, for Islamic uh, uh, in, uh, rulers in general. And they pick up some example of some Kashmir Hindu king who was no good as an example of how they were all corrupt. So again, data is accurate data, but ex ex exaggerated and taken out of context and turned into something very big. So Sanskrit died under those circumstances. It is a dead language. 
and therefore they studied like Greek and classic, uh, Greek and Latin, which are dead languages. Greek and classic, uh, uh, Greek and uh, uh, Latin are considered classical languages because classical languages in the European context means a dead language which is not living. It lives in a museum. You put it in the museum and scholars study it and then you are very, you talk about in a very patriotic way that this is our ancestor. They used to be like that. It's not living today. And I am not happy with Sanskrit being called a classical language because Chinese do not think of Mandarin as a classical language, but a living language. Arabs don't think of Arabic as a classical language, but a living language. Iranians think of Persian as a living language. Russians think of Russian and Japanese think of Japanese as living old languages, but living. So Sanskrit to me is an old language, which is living language, and we ought to make it more living rather than saying it's a dead language, classic. And classical is a very uh, so sophisticated, polite, proud way for you to support this idea. So when they say it is one of the greatest classical languages, Indian class, oh wow, you know, it's like saying you are one of the best dead people sitting there. <laughs> yeah, and you clap, wow, we call me one of the best. You know? So our people are also stupid. In, I mean, we are really fools. We are really fools with how easy it is to dupe our people. So I face a lot of resistance from our own people who, who can't understand what I'm doing because they are in so much in awe of this kind of scholarship. And I, I'm telling you this is not my biggest uh, obstruction is not uh, Westerners so much or Indian leftists so much, but my own fellow Hindu intellectuals and activists who just don't get it. And they are a little bit this way, a little bit that way, uh, quite mixed up, quite uh, opportunistic, mainly interested in getting ahead very quickly and not wanting to go deep enough uh, and call a spade a spade. So our, our own people are, uh, 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 and I don't want to name big institutions, but we have very big uh, Hindu institutions that are also guilty of all this. So uh, I'll just uh, leave it at that. I'm in enough trouble already, so I don't want to create any more. Um, so this, this, uh, I'm just, I just gave you a, li a view of uh, some of the issues that I mentioned in this book. Uh, and I've given a lot of data, examples, quotations, and whatnot. So um, what we need to do today, I will now talk about what we need to do today. We need to revive the Purva Paksh tradition. The Purva Paksh tradition means the study of Western Indology, the study of whoever the others are. And I'm focusing on Western Indology. I don't have the skills to study China or Pakistan or others. Uh, there are many other people who can do it. All of those need to be done, but I'm studying Western Indology as my specialty for the last many decades. This requires introducing a whole new kind of uh, uh, curriculum in Sanskrit studies. It's not enough to just learn the language and, and not enough to learn a few important texts and repeat what was written and said by debati debaters a thousand years ago. Uh, you have to be innovative and you have to start new arguments, new battles, new debates the way I am. That is what our scholars need to do. And it takes a whole different level of scholarship to, to do that. Um, the intellectual kshatriyas that I want, uh, I'm sorry to say that very few of them are really intellectual. Most of them are emotional kshatriyas. There's a difference between intellectual kshatriya and emotional kshatriya. The emotional kshatriya is somebody who's got all these outbursts. He's got his emotions out of control. He's got this anger. He's shouting slogans. And that's very easy to do. I mean, I wouldn't be working so hard if that's all I wanted to do. I could just do it. I could have done it 25 years ago. There's nothing new to do. But intellectual Kshatriya has to first be an intellectual. And, he, and to be an intellectual Kshatriya, you have to be a good writer. That's the means of uh, being an intellectual. And you cannot learn to become a good writer unless you're a good reader. So, you know, if you can't read more than just two, three pages, and it's not something worth your while, and you don't have the attention span, you're not well informed, and you cannot become a writer. You can kind of show off and quickly write some things. But people, our people need to read a lot more. They, read, need, they really need to read, take a serious book, take 10 pages a day and make it your job to just read it a couple of times. And it will make sense. Maybe the first time you read it, 50% you will understand. That's a lot. If you can get 50% out of uh, uh, one of my books, even 25%, it's a lot of knowledge you will have. And then you read a second time, later on you will get twice as much. So this uh, habit of reading 
complex material, good arguments, understanding is something our people need to develop. We need more reading skills, book clubs, things of that sort. Then um, we need many uh, initiatives. I call some, I, I have coined a term Swadeshi Indology. Swadeshi Indology. So rather than Videshi Indology, which is foreign view of Indology, we need Swadeshi Indology, which is our own view of Indology. And I will explain what, I mean, in the final chapter, I will explain what are the projects we need, what are the projects, who should do it, how much, what funding we need. I've put all those things out. So I'm not just showing problems, I'm also proposing concrete solutions. In the final chapter, I've listed 18 debates we need to have, 18 topics, what the other side is saying, and how we have to debate them. I have 18 debates. So this morning at the Sanskrit University, I told them, and they were very happy. They want to pick five topics and help me debate. That's what we need. People, I told them, look, you pick the topics. You firstly have your best scholars read all this. You, you pick the topics, and then I'll come back in two or three months, and we'll have a big brainstorm for a few days, and your best scholars will debate these topics. And I will represent the Western Indology and debate you. Okay? I will play the role of the Western Indologist and say, this is our position, give me the answer. And let's see if you can give the answer. That is how debating is learned. And they're very interested and excited and committed to do this. But then they said, sir, where will the funding come from? That I don't know. See, we don't have these funding, millions going in the wrong things. Millions are going into all kind of stuff here and there in, in, the, in this field. But for the serious work I want to do, just to get a few people uh, incentivized and con uh, you know, renting halls and travel and this and that, we're not talking about crores, but we're talking about a few lakhs. It's very difficult to raise funds for this sort of project. That's sad. I can't, I mean, that's for people like you to have to come together and put something, put a budget together, put some money together so we can do these things. So my role, I, I use the expression in this book, another dangerous expression. I'm doing many dangerous things in my books and I always get uh, attacked. So another phrase, another phrase I use, I thought it's pretty cool, but they tell me, no, 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 it's dangerous. So I said, okay, I'll definitely put it there. <laughs> so so I, put, I, I say that we have to remove the burqa from the mind. This is a mental burqa. Uh, there's burqa in the sense that only a little bit of light comes from two places and we don't win dark. So we got a little bit of light coming and we are living a whole life sitting like that. We have to remove this. Even our own traditional guys have to get rid of the burqa of the mind. So I will, um, I will stop there because I could just go on, but uh, maybe what we should do, uh, Mohanji, is to have some interesting Q&A Q &A session. Thank you so much for listening. All of you have a lot of questions, I'm sure. I'd like to request you all to keep your questions very brief, to the point, you know, the what, why, where, how, if, and such question, direct, okay? Uh, just announce your name, ask the question. Don't go into a monologue, right? Because there are a lot of people having questions and you should do justice to them. So kindly come over to the stage. Stand in a queue, one by one we can do it. Yeah, Heman. Yeah. So my question is, recently I came across this post, uh, Sanskrit at St. James in England, and they said that they are starting a course, one year course for uh, sign, uh, Sanskrit and Vedanta, and the uh, uh, participants will get a uh, certification after they have done uh, f fully thorough uh, reading of their textbooks, and after a Sanskrit exam, given, uh, prepared by Cambridge. So like, uh, they, whenever the West does it, they do it with complete rigor. Like, from bottom up, they will design their own courses and all that. So where does this stem from, like institutional rigor or individual rigor? So what is the question? Question is like, they do it with such rigor. No, that is the statement. Now what's the question at the end yeah. of that? So is this rigor because of the institutions or because of the individuals? Okay. The, the rigor Indians had 
far greater. If you look at the old texts and the old debates, their rigor, the analysis, the response, very, very high standard. But somehow we lost it. We just lost this ability to be so analytical like it used to be the case. And now it's more bhakti of Sanskrit so as, and more, more uh, reverence than actually analytical rigor. So the Westerners apply rigor, but their revival of Sanskrit is often suffering from these areas of removing the sacred, looking at it as for exploitation of Dalits and women and so on, and as a political system. So when they say they're reviving Sanskrit, that itself is not enough to feel happy about. You have to then see, okay, that is at the introductory level. They just want kids to learn something, you know, they'll teach them and it, there's no controversy there. As they go to more advanced levels, so what you have to look at is not what they're going to teach school, school people, but what are they teaching in colleges because that is what they're le leading them to. It is you introduce somebody in a nice way and then you lead him to somewhere else. So what is, what is the Indology at a higher education that they have? That is what I'm critiquing. So uh, you can get into a very nice, happy chi child stage kind of level, which is very good. But then as you are in it, later and later, gradually it changes. You have to keep that in mind. I'll tell you an example. Harvard, many, uh, 20 years ago, I, somebody told me that uh, when you take Hindi at Harvard, they're actually teaching you Urdu. And I was very surprised, so I went there and looked at their catalog and sat in some classes. And yes, they had Hindi 101, Urdu 101. The next level was 102, Hindi 102, Urdu, like that. There are four levels, up to 104 you can go. So whether you registered for Hindi 101 <coughs> or whether you registered for Urdu 101, they were, the teacher, the sit, they're all sitting in the same class. And the teacher is one man called Ali Asani, a Pakistani. He's teaching Hindi 101 and Urdu 101 simultaneously. And he would start by giving a little Devanagari and a little bit of Urdu, a little bit equal in the first semester. In his house, he would call them for dinners and you know, make them feel happy and uh, social events. But there it was all Urdu, Mushaira, poetry, beautiful language like that. And the Hindi would be protest, the Dalit protesting story of the women being raped and all the stories. The stories he would pick for the reading list were not nice for the Hindi, but were very beautiful. These Urdu people, they, they are smoking their hookah and making rugs and very nice people. This kind of thing. Hindus are, the Indian, the Hindi walas are doing bad things. And then he could say, I'm just giving you a lot of things to read. So when you go to Hindi 102 and Urdu 102, then he starts saying that, you know, this Hindi is very complex. You can get the same knowledge and ideas through Urdu also. So the script that he starts teaching is more Urdu script, phasing out the Devanagari. And the subject matter is more and more Urduized. By the time you are in 104 level, you are totally gone as far as you, you I met, I got this from a couple who were Indians, Hindus from good, solid Hindu parents, uh, husband, wife, they met in this class, both Hindus, and they'd gone through this training and they hated the, they had, they were full of this, but isn't it caste system, sir, and didn't the RNs come? I mean, all that kind of thing put into their brainwashing. So how they started was very beautiful in the early stage. Gradually where they took it was very dangerous. So you have to evaluate a whole program from beginning to end. You have to evaluate where it starts, how these people later years, where it takes them. The point being that if we lose control over the teaching of Sanskrit and Sanskriti, no matter how beautiful it looks like they're doing, it's not going to end up well. We have to provide the curriculum. You know, Japan provides a curriculum called how to study Japanese language, Japanese culture, Japanese history, Japanese thought. They have a Japan foundation and they have DVDs and training programs, and they are the ones who do it. Similarly, China Institute provides the, cult the curriculum to the American s school system on how to teach China. Japan, uh, Korea Foundation has on how to teach Korea. A Council on Islamic Relations gives you books and gives you material how to teach Islam. We are happy that we don't have to do it, sir, they are doing it. So I, I, I have a problem 
because this never ends up well. Outsourcing our culture to others is what we did during the East India Company time. They came and said, we'll take all your manuscripts. You know, most Sanskrit manuscripts, the oldest ones are outside India, even today. They were taken because they would look after it more and they will give us all the knowledge we need. Well, we should get it back, you see. So I, I think the custody of uh, our tradition, how to teach it, the curriculums, the, pe the pedagogy should be developed here by people who are uh, trained in a traditional system. They have, they have shraddha, uh, they have sadhana, and it's these, our own people who are to be developing this and exporting it. Yeah, uh, I am Anil Kumar, uh, running my uh, small software company in Bangalore. Uh, <coughs> uh, I've been uh, trying to uh, promote some of the issues you have uh, mentioned in uh, Breaking India. Uh, even uh, online also, I read so many articles, but none of them uh, the debate point to point. Rather, they have mastered uh, literature of diluting the serious issues. So I'm whatever sure. the serious issues you pick up, they start uh, diluting them. Oh, I'm not understanding. Can, maybe the mic is not yeah. clear. Can you can you explain what he's saying? The question is, he has been responding, raising issues in certain ways for the opponents to answer, okay. pointing out the problems. Okay. Instead, what they do is to trivialize it. Yeah. And the question is, how do we handle such situation? Because we raise an important issue, they are trivializing it. Okay. So, so we are not getting to get them to respond. So I have, Am I, right? yeah. I have my, huh? Is that exactly. Right? Okay, good point. How do you keep okay, them I sharp? I understand. Yeah. Firstly, don't get emotional. When you are dealing with them, when they, when you are dealing with them, yeah. When you deal, yeah, stand. There. Yeah. When you are dealing with them, yeah. don't get emotional. Our people get emotional. Don't okay. get angry. Keep your cool. Huh? If they are misbehaving point it out. If they are being racist, trivializing, point it out. Say, I am an insider, you are studying my culture, I have a right to talk about it from the insider perspective, whether you agree or disagree, don't trivialize me, don't insult me. So we have to have the confidence to say that. You also have to read a lot about what they are doing so you can point out their flaws. The point is they read us a lot, we don't read them a lot. They send anthropologists to study village power problem, uh, you know, what is happening to women, what is happening to all kind of communities here and there, and they write, write, write PhDs, dissertations about us. So they got a lot of our knowledge, and we think they're doing us a favor by studying us, okay? We have not sent scholars to study their culture, their society, what is wrong in it. We only read it on s w newspapers and watch CNN, but we haven't really done scholarship. So we cannot bring them down, they can bring us down. They know what your vulnerabilities are. They know that they'll say certain things and get you angry, okay? So we quickly get angry and play into that. So you have to keep your cool, not get upset, and you have to know how to hit back in a very s s clever, strategic way without losing your cool, but just in a factual way. Now, if you start doing that, then you become like me. Then they'll want to get rid of you, stop you, ignore you, whatever. But if we, enough people are becoming like that, it makes a huge difference. So I need many more people doing this. And yes, at first they will trivialize you, but you know, this is part of the territory. Nobody gives, nobody vacates. No hostile person who's occupied your home is going to vacate nicely and happily. You have to kick them out in a very strong way. And uh, it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick. Our people who are becoming activists are very surprised that it is not so easy. And they, I tell them that, okay, if it were easy, why would I waste so much of my time doing so much life doing this, you know? It's not going to be easy. And if it is easy, then they fooled you. They really, you know, so you have to be prepared for a very long struggle. This is a very long struggle. And you will find that besides the Western scholars, you will also end up having a lot of fight with our own people because they will not like what you're doing. Our own people. Swami Vivekananda said, ridicule, opposition, and then acceptance. I think ridicule is what the trivializing is all about. So next question, please come. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I have been listening to your lectures on uh, religion, on uh, embodied religion, on 
lot of other things. And I have, I'm a very big fan of yours. And it's very my privilege to speak to you today. Sir, uh, I am not a very good uh, scholar. <coughs> I'm not very well versed with all Vedic literature and all that. But uh, today, off late in India, we heard, uh, we hear a lot of things on intolerance, these, that, and all that things. A lot of big, big things, which 99% of the people hardly have any knowledge, but still they uh, comment on that. So my basic uh, question is, there are simple two questions. Uh, in our Vedic literature, is there anything, uh, any word like secularism? Is there anything, uh, any word like secularism in our Vedic literature? Very good, I will answer and that. If there is any word like secularism in our Vedic literature, then there has to be a certain meaning to it, which is embodied in our Hinduism uh, uh, religion as such. And if there is a secularism word, how is it different from today's secularism, today's secular people? This is the most brilliant question. I, uh, in fact, uh, good, I will answer this. Okay. One of the things I discovered when I'm, when I'm analyzing atheists, Today's Western Indologists were atheists who are therefore removing the sacred part of the Vedic stuff. No, it's no, they no longer think of it as Shruti Praman. So when they are doing that, they're atheists. It suddenly occurred to me one morning that we had people called Charvaks in the ancient times. You know, they were Charvaks was one school of thought. Yeah, yeah, I know. And these Charvaks were atheists. They were atheists who made fun of the Vedas. They did not agree with anything spiritual. They, they said it is all primitive, backward, it's all mumbo jumbo. They made fun of it. They were very serious scholars. They were good Sanskrit scholars, some of them. Uh, but ideologically, metaphysically, they dismissed anything to do with the, the transcendental realm, anything to do with Paramartika. So as I was studying the Western Indologists' views on Paramartika, it suddenly occurred to me that this is what the Charvaks used to do. So today's Marxists and atheists could be considered the return of the Charvaks. Okay. okay. I have a section in this book called Return of the Charvaks. I have a section in this book. So the Indologists today are a new kind of Charvak. The difference, the similarities I already told you that they reject the Vedas, they reject any transcendental realm, you know, they, they think it's all. Uh, uh, kind of fooling the people, mumbo jumbo, it's buffoonery, like that. Uh, what is different is also very important. Today's Charvaks, so think of them as Charvaks 2.0, these guys, are more dangerous because they have more power, they have material wealth, they are coming from very rich places, they have more money than our poor Brahmins today here. They control the discourse in terms of the, uh, the journals, the conferences, the, you know, the dissertations. So, whereas in the past, the Charvaks did not have power. They had intellectual freedom because we never denied people intellectual freedom. They had intellectual freedom, but they did not have this material power. and They were not the ones who were willing to buy us off with grants and money like today's Charvaks can. Today's Charvak comes. I'm told that some of the most important and brilliant Sanskrit scholars are on their payroll. To, I'm told this, but I'm given names of people. Some though I know, but I was meeting some guy here and he gave me names of a few others. He said, these are such good scholars, but they've been sold out because they'll come and buy the best. They have money, they'll buy the best. So the Charvak 2.0 is better funded than the Charvak 1.0. The Charvak 2.0 is aligned with global powers the Charvak 1.0 was just a regular Indian. He was not aligned with something in foreign country. There was no age of globalization. He was not speaking for some guy sitting in Harvard, Columbia, you know, uh, Oxford and all that. He was just local guy. So the Charvak 2.0 is more dangerous for that reason. Also, ideologically, the Charvak 2.0 can say that the entire rise of science and technology in the last 500 years is because of we, the Charvaks, we, the secularists, we, the atheists, when you make cars, there's nothing to do with transcendental realm and paramartika. When you make a telephone, when you make an airplane, all these are very atheistic. They have no place for any spirituality. You don't need spirituality to learn physics, mathematics, and all that. So they can give you a very solid argument that the material development, advancement of medicine and all kind of economic stuff is thanks to uh, religion being taken to the side and this new science and technology being developed. That would be their argument. 
Now, we may say that there was science in ancient India and all that, but they'll say, yes, for the last 500 years, we, the Westerners, have dominated. Maybe you had it earlier. And our domination is because of the atheism we brought into science. So this Charvak 2.0 has an argument which the previous Charvak didn't have. Previous Charvak didn't have. Yes. Okay. Also, the new Charvak has the benefit of Marxism to come up with very sophisticated analysis about class exploitation, how these, elite, these Brahmanical elites are exploiting the others. This kind of Marxist exploitation, class struggle was not the vocabulary of the earlier Charvaks. They were doing their argument based on philosophy and, and logic and so on. They were very logical people, but they were not making social, uh, they were not making human rights oppression as their argument. Today's Charvak weapon is human rights. He yes. says you are violating human rights. The Charvak of the past has other arguments, but you, this, one, this is a new argument they've got. Yes. So today's Charvak also is armed with feminism. You know, he says, okay, now half the population is feminist, they're being exploited, I'm going to get them on my side, I'm going to get them all excited and upset. So he can bring that weapon, yeah? And the Charvaks of the past didn't have this kind of sophisticated, developed feminist argument. Postmodernism. Postmodernism is a very dangerous thing for our tradition because it's disguised as something that is against colonialism and against the Western domination, it is, but it replaces the old domination with a new kind of domination. So people, our people don't understand. Postmodernism is a very deceptive thing because it fights colonialism, it fights materialism, it fights all these kind of things that you and I would fight, but it replaces with some new kind of, uh, kind of privilege that they enjoy, which is very subtle to understand. So the charvak of today is a, f a, is a highly evolved charvak. So charvaks have evolved over the last 500 years into very sophisticated, smart, you know, well-organized machinery. They have well-organized machinery, these leftist people. So I like the term Charvak 2.0. I'm popularizing that now in this book, introducing it. Because it gives our scholars a map in which to locate them. Because in old times, we debated the Charvaks very successfully. We, de we did Purv Paksha of the Charvaks and responded to them very successfully. So we need to now tell our uh, traditional scholars that the Charvaks have come back. That is the return of the Charvaks. And now they've come back and they're eating your lunch. They are bossing you. So why are you not able to respond? Previously we did, so we have to respond again. So this is my way of locating this whole left-wing Marxist, atheist group of ideological things that are out there as Charvaks. This, by using this vocabulary, we put them in our frame of thinking, our frame of thinking. You see, because as long as we call them atheists, secularists and all that, the discourse, the literature is so sophisticated and controlled by the West, our per person is scared to even take them on. Our traditionalists don't know how to take them on. We are scared, our people are scared. But when you say he's a charvak, then the guy says, okay, I understand. You see, yes. so this is my answer to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There was a saying, what Bengal thinks today, India thinks tomorrow. And today the state of Bengal is just the opposite. So there was a very recent uh, incident in a small district called Malda where around <coughs> two lakh Muslims had gathered and they had burnt a police station and not even one Bengali intellectual raised his or her voice. So maybe what they're doing today, India will do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. So my question uh, is like, from a land which gave us Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, so, uh, Ram Krishna Par Paramhans and Sri Aurobindo, who were so dharmic people, and that is the land or the place where Durga Puja, the Shakti Puja is celebrated with great pomp for five days together. The Shakti and the Bhakti both have gone. Durga Puja is now transformed into a Durgotsav. It's more of like a celebration and Utsav. It's 
Apart from the bhakti and shakti, it's more of masti and commercialism. So this, this is what has happened probably, uh, as you said, because of the modern day charvaks and the Marxists who ruled Bengal for 30 years. So how do we revive the old traditional and uh, culture and the glory, bring back the bhakti and shakti? So Bengal also was the home of uh, Ram, Ram Mohan Roy, who was a sellout. I mean, we pra praise him as a great guy, but he was one of the early guys who Christianized. He Christianized Hinduism and uh, brought, he's one of the beginning, the, the beginning of this whole problem starts when the British are able to convince Ram Mohan Roy to convert to Unitarian Church. And so uh, he, he is the fellow who begins his fashion to anglicize and promote. You know, before Macaulay, we blame Macaulay for anglicizing our education system. But most of you might not know, before Macaulay, Ram Mohan Roy writes a letter to the British demanding that they should bring anglicized education to India to advance us, to cure us of all our superstitions and backwardness. The, the request that you have to bring comes from the Ram Mohan Roy side and then of course Macaulay takes it further. So Ram Mohan was a guy like that a long time ago. He, he would be happy that all this child work is going on because he was also mixed up like that. He was spiritually inclined but Christian spiritually inclined. So I think as far as Bengal is concerned, they have had both extremes. They've had the extreme of uh, the spiritual giants that you've named, but that is the Naxalbari movement also. They start, they have been the pioneers in all this Marxism and things like that. So uh, I wouldn't want that what is Bengal today, every India should become tomorrow. I think uh, that, is, that would be a dangerous thing because Bengal is probably getting out of hand, getting out of hand. It may be far more dangerous with this Bangladesh overflowing. It may be a Bangladeshi takeover, is what we are seeing. It, uh, you know, it could be a more dangerous thing that's happening with Pakistan on the western side. This is very dangerous problem. Because you see the Avanto border and the whole northeast and all the rivers come from there and all. It's a very dangerous uh, uh, political situation and, and uh, the government doesn't seem to have much uh, power to change it. And it's complete opportunism sellout. What will get you votes? What will get you money? Just do it. Short-term thinking. That's what's happened in Bengal. So I hope that's not how India is going to be, but it may be. I don't have a magic solution. Thank you. My question is regarding, I've come across various schools of thoughts regarding the history of Sanskrit. Like Sanskrit is one of the ancient, and as you were saying that, uh, ancient languages of the entire world is the culture. Then the Max Muller's that theory is came in between. Then the Aryan Dravidian concept. After that, we heard that like from the Devanagari Lipi, the Sanskrit language has originated and all the South Indian languages have come from the Dravidian or Tamil Lipi like that. So I just want to know what is the exact means uh, origin of the Sanskrit language and from how past it is like continuing and how Max Muller's theory have exploited because the division of states what have taken place after independence that was also based on language and culture. So how this has affected because Sanskrit as a Vedic language was one of the primary factors for the unity and integrity of this land stretched between the Himalayas to the Indian Ocean. Now discrimination based on language and later on it is coming to culture. Now it is again going on to various uh, means uh, orthodox thoughts and human rights and all those things is coming. So I just want to know how this started and what is the origin. Of it. So you see, India always had diversity, which is one of the beautiful things, but it was never politicized. It was never turned into vote bank. It was never turned into one group has to be exploited. I'm your leader, please vote for me and the blame goes to those guys, I'm going to accuse them, I'm going to make you fight them. That exploitation dividing up people based on language or anything is a very recent phenomenon. You don't have language wars in ancient times. You do not have. You do not have anybody uh, telling people of a certain language to go and uprise and attack and discard people of another language. There is no Raja in the Indian history who's fighting on grounds of language. This is very interesting. This whole thing is very recently made up. So the problem of difference in languages is, is not uh, the, because of the languages or because of Sanskriti, but because of this uh, imported idea of uh, uh, class struggle and trying to show you are victim, you, uh, you are victim of exploitation. Those guys are the ones who are exploiting you. 
that method of studying is devastated us. And that is the Charvak method of study. The Charvak method of studying who we are uh, has created camps, made them fight each other. So what would have been just a very ordinary intellectual discussion on how did things originate and what is the relationship between this language and that language which uh, people who are scholars would just study out of you know, interest has now turned into political. So if I can show that your language is separate from his language, that means you need a separate state. I can help you get that state, I'll be the chief minister. So there are all these political agendas. If I can show that that language are dominant, yours was uh, oppressed by them thousands of generations ago, then I can get your favor to be the person representing you and you'll be angry at those people. These are very, uh, com this communalism, political communalism based on differences of all kinds, including languages, is a very recent thing in India. So that's my, that's my view of it. I would like to encourage the study of these things, but keep the politics out. Just look at it intellectually and see what the facts are. Whatever they are, I'm happy with it. Now this uh, uh, business that Sanskrit came from elsewhere is a product of the 1800s. Until the 1800s, nobody had proposed it. Nobody had said it. Nobody was championing this idea. It's a very recent kind of an idea. The Bishop Caldwell in the Dravidian championing and Max Miller championing the Aryan. Uh, they are the two founding fathers of much of India's trouble. So don't let anybody tell you that Indology doesn't matter to our practical lives. It matters because look at what a mess it can create. So I haven't... Uh, given you a solution to coming up with a clean historical view that makes everybody happy. I think it's a dynamic area of research. This has to be done. Uh, Sheldon Pollock, whose books I'm criti critiquing, and other Western Indologists have their theory, okay? And their theory is this Aryan theory, and the local the in, in the vernaculars are sort of weaker. They're dominated by Sanskrit power asymmetry. I don't buy that. I don't buy that. And, I, and you know, a language need not have one origin. It need not have a localized origin. I mean, you look at software. You cannot say that the whole software is made in this place because maybe some module came from there, some module came from there. It traveled, they enhanced it, sent it back. So there used to be similarly a communication of people over large distances, of course, much slower. Instead of in a few seconds, it may take them many, many years to travel, but this was going on. And people were bringing stories back and forth. People were bringing linguistic ideas, philosophies, all these things were going on. So we don't have to even accept that a language need necessarily had a location where it originated. It's not a artificial language, artificial system where five guys sit in a room and they come up with a design and they say, okay, this is the language everybody will be taught. It is not necessarily like that. It may have gone through a lot of experimentation. A lot of people trying out, so some things go viral. So some constructs went viral, some words went viral, some grammatical ideas went viral. And so these, this, this is what I'm proposing in this book. I'm calling it a kind of a loose decentralized web architecture for the evolution of languages. I have a chapter in this book where I take on their theory of language which says somebody has to win, somebody has to lose. It's very divisive, localized origin of a language. And I'm saying it need not be the case. You could have had a network of things going on that create these languages and keep them in dynamic equilibrium with each other. They're learning from back and forth from each other. It's not that it had to originate in one local point. Uh, that would have been very unusual. Yeah. So uh, the, the theory, the, the linguistic history that has been taught all these uh, years for, to us says that some language originated somewhere and then some army or some aggressive people invaded and spread it like that. It need not have been like that. It could have been much more, uh, you know, kind of back and forth network of influences, back and forth. The way ideas have, we know that uh, metallurgy idea starts here, then somebody somewhere else picks it up and takes it further. We know that uh, uh, mathematics, something from the Kerala school, and some years later, somebody in Punjab writes a, a, a talks about it, comments about it, and discusses it and makes it go further. So ideas have gone back and forth in, in many areas, and also probably in language. So I would, I would propose a new approach 
which says you do not need to have language, you do not need to assume that a language had a local origin in one location. So the question of where did it originate is not there anymore because nothing says a language needs to originate in one place. And this idea, the, the counter argument they give is that it takes usually some person to come up with its grammar. But why, how do you know that? Uh, even if you look at uh, the grammar, before Panini were many others, many grammarians who are building on each other, they're commenting on each other, they're, they're, they're aware of each other, they're re referring to each other by name. So even something like grammar, if you th think of it like so source code, you know, it, it also has, it is like open source, it has taken things from before and included them. So if you look at open source collaborative, collaborative development, Wikipedia type thing, okay, where it is the contribution of a lot of people and that turns into a beautiful language. It could also have been like that. It doesn't have to have one local author who came up with the language. Hello, I'm Ashwin. So uh, I've been actually been struggling with all the question. I do have a concern of just one thing that you said a couple of times about class struggles and a Marxist viewpoint. Uh, it is that I hope you're not denying the truth behind the Marxist viewpoint behind the class struggles because to deny that would be to sanitize and erase a, a painful portion of Indian history. No, no, uh, we, we've had problems and we still have problems. Yeah. I'm not denying that. It's a question of how do you analyze the problem? The problem is there. There has been exploitation all over the world. We've had yes. it too. Yes. But we've had our own approaches to it. We've had our own internal revolutions. We've had bhakti movements. We've had many kinds of solutions also from within. They were not imported from somewhere else. Right. Okay. And so the, dif the difference is when it is our own experience and our own original idea, it is more likely to work. If it is imported, then somebody else controls whether you're doing it right or not. You, he's giving you funds. Your loyalty is over there. You're constantly flying there and getting training for more. It is like somebody sends you an app and you download the app. Now you are also dependent on this guy. He'll send you the next version, the next version, and he'll constantly train you, make you use it properly. Whereas if you developed it yourself, then you know you have that power more on your own hands. So I'm not against uh, the study of social problems, exploitation, uh, injustice. These things exist in every society. It is horrible that they exist. We have to study them and we have to counter them. But we are smart people who should be able to come up with our own ideas. But can we do this? See, my concern is, uh, I'm not, I don't like to be labeled left, right, center, like I'm just a human good, being, so. Good, See, everywhere where the human condition exists, there has been struggle, evolutionary psychologists are puzzled by it. Why is that we do what we do? But that is for them to figure out. Can we do the kind of studies what you're saying without sanitizing and denying Yes, the pains of the past because it's very real. No, Kabeera that is true. Say, I don't, happen. I don't subscribe to an idealized past. I don't. Right. And my idea of dharma revival is not going back but going forward. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. For example, the population of South Asia was probably five million in the Vedic era. Five million. In Aurangzeb's time, it is three hundred million. And in British time, it is 300 million. 300 million for South Asia. Okay. So now it's 1.5 billion. Okay. So from 3 million to 1.5 billion is a huge factor already. So if you, you can go back and say that probably in the time of uh, when the Mughals came, it was like maybe 100 million. Okay. You keep going back. You take it to the time of Buddha, maybe it was uh, 25 million. Like that, if you keep going back, my guess is that I don't know if anybody has done a forecast on this. But I, or, or kind of going back in time, I would say that uh, uh, Vedic population might have been a few million. Okay. Now the scalability of their lifestyle, you have to question. So let's say they are cremating with wood. Okay. And they're using wood to uh, make some concoction of something. It may not be viable for 1.5 million people to live that lifestyle because we don't have enough forests. You would need a whole uh, planet uh, bigger than us to supply so much wood. You see what I'm saying? The use of water, the, the population density going up by such a huge factor means that resources have to be used with greater intensity. So you need more intensive farming, 
more intensive use of water, better utilization of wood, then you have to have artificial substitutes for some of these natural things because you don't have enough nature with such a huge population. So the scale of population going up so much makes it, in my opinion, very difficult to go back to the Vedic era and give that Vedic lifestyle to such a large population. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay, right. It's a, it's a logical argument I'm giving. Mm -hmm. I want uh, the people who say we should go back to Vedic times to show me on a spreadsheet, I want a quantitative model that if everybody has to get up and do this yagna, we, how much ghee we'll need, how much firewood we'll need, uh, if you all want to cremate with sandalwood, how many sandalwood forests we'll need. You know, if you look at the consumption of nature, in the Vedic era, they didn't have to be efficient because it was abundant. Very few people in a forest, green, beautiful forest area, forest in India, uh, did not need intensive farming because there's plenty of food growing for a small population. You follow what I'm saying? So is that lifestyle scalable for today's population density? That is, that, is what, that is the kind of provocative question I ask. So I don't accept this business that you go back. I want to take certain metaphysical, certain philosophical, certain spiritual techniques and principles we have and make them, adapt them for the 21st century. And I'm, I, don't, I think we have to bring them forward. Oh, yes. Now our tradition has differentiated Shruti and Smriti precisely for that. Shruti are the eternal principles. Smriti is what you have to rewrite. You have to modernize. Okay. So Smriti are the texts that you have to adapt and rewrite also. The laziness of our thinkers has been that we are not doing new Smritis. We are supposed to do new Smritis. So we are supposed to do economic policy as a Smriti, political thought as a Smriti, social justice as a Smriti. So these are not things we have to necessarily import. We have to write our own social theory Smriti. It's a bigger challenge than uh, we are willing to face today. So I'm actually very critical of the traditionalists who just want to take a lazy approach and keep chanting what happened and said we bring it back. It may not work. So we have to, this is the age where there's technology. So we have some resources also, which we, they didn't have. We have the burden of too much population, which they didn't have in the past. But we also have the, the, the advantage of assets of some technology that they didn't have. So we have to reconfigure the dharma for today. And this is something not available in the Abrahamic religions because they're closed canon book right. and they're history centric. And you're not allowed to amend that. You're not allowed to be too innovative. We can be innovative. So, so our tradition is not frozen and stuck in a corner like some other traditions are. And I oppose the traditional scholars who are not innovative, who are closed minded. We have to be able to think of issues, problems of the past with a fresh idea. We do not need to borrow the Westerner critique, nor do we need to deny the problems. Okay. Right. Just one small comment. Um, you did mention about the transcendence and how the Vedas and all that, but transcendence is actually a facet of the human condition. It's a tiny thing. Like we here in India, we, we I see a lot of people behaving as if we invented that. It's not. If you take poets like William Blake, if you take great minds like uh, I'm not able to remember, he was a transcendental master. I don't see Indians appreciating that. They all, William Blake's poem, Tiger, Tiger Burning Bright, it's, it is actually a poem, a poetry about Advaita, but when I try to tell people, like, no, 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 Advaita is Indian, it's not. Many, okay, that? several things. Transcendence is, transcendence is not Indian. It is not, transcendence is the nature of reality. If it's the nature of reality, it's not, there's no nationality to it. It's, it's like gravitation, there's no, it's, okay. Different cultures experienced it differently. Okay, so some Christian mystic is experienced it his way. Some Sufi poet may have experienced it his way. Our rishis experienced it a, a certain way. So it's not that the transcendence is Indian, that, but the way India's, Indians have experienced the transcendence is something distinct. That is the distinctiveness. What is distinct is not that we have the Indian gravitation law, which is different from the British gravitation law. It is not like that. It is science and it is universal. So the nature of truth is universal, but our understanding of it, the, our discovery of it is, has its own qualities. So, okay. Now, as far as William Blake and all these guys are concerned, I can send you some books which show the Vedantin influence on British poets. You should read that. T.S. Eliot. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Okay. There is a book called T.S. Eliot and Indic Traditions. Okay. I'll get, send you a copy from the U.S. Uh, it's written by Cleo Kearns, who did her PhD, in, and it was published by Cambridge University Press. 
she went and lived in T.S. Eliot's house. He had been dead, but his widow had all his old books and all. And she saw that he had Gita, he had Upanishads, he was a Sanskrit scholar at Harvard. And he was studying these things. And he was so deeply immersed in Indian thought. He thought, he even contemplated uh, giving his American citizenship, coming to India and settling down and becoming a Vedantin practitioner. And he writes in a book, in a diary, that, uh, that this is so profound that he uses the term, by comparison, uh, the Western thinkers look like schoolboys. That's his comment. Okay. And then he says that for me to continue my journey further, I will have to give up my identity as an Anglo-American in English man living in America and become different. Am I willing to do that? The price is I'll give up my family, my friends. Am I really willing to do that? So he makes a conscious choice that I call the U-turn moment. He makes a conscious choice that he wants to reclaim his Christian identity because it's becoming too dangerous to go. He's being sucked into this other area. It is so beautiful and so exciting that he's being sucked into that, the Vedic culture. So he does a very public, uh, uh, what do they do? When, baptism. He does a very public baptism as a mature man, which is very rare. Normally you do baptism when you're a child. But this is to show the world that I'm, I'm, I did not go away, I'm back. This is his U-turn moment. It's a very exciting thing. Now, his works, uh, the, the Wasteland, yeah? uh, the Four Quartets, some of the most famous poems of the 20th century are translations of Upanishads. In fact, he has copies of Upanishads and in the side in Sanskrit and he's translating in English. And that diary, those translations of Upanishad verses then evolve further into his English poems. So there's a book, Somebody did a PhD, a Western woman, whom I know very well. She helped me. I acknowledge her in my books also. Uh, Cleo Kearns wrote this book called T.S. Eliot and Indic Traditions. And this book will tell you, you uh, I showed this to Delhi University people, very proud English honors. They're very angry when I show them that your famous poet is from the culture you've rejected. <laughs> my niece, who's one of these... My niece, very proud English honors, oh, very sophisticated, or oh, like they're more American than the Americans, this is some years ago. We were having this conversation. Her parents brought her to me that, you know, you please fix her, but she's gone, she's gone away. Like that. <laughs> yeah. So I said, you know, because your method is, your method is wrong, you're kind of heavy handed, you know, don't do this, don't do that, come do this puja and all, she's not liking all that. So I wanted to sit there and have a conversation. And so I started by saying, okay, forget what these parents are saying. I don't, I'm not like them. What is your interest? So she was a great uh, thing, a great interest in, uh, she was doing, doing English, so we started talking about T.S. Eliot. So we had a good conversation on T.S. Eliot. So she hit it off with me. So I said, in the basement, I have a book I want to give you. So I went and got this book. I have a few of them sitting. So I gave her this book. Actually, my foundation got rights to publish it in India. And we published a few copies in India. Uh, Makaran Pranjpe, I gave him this grant to publish it in India so that Indian students of English honors could understand that the most famous poet was actually inspired by our tradition. So I gave her this book. She's very, very happy. And then next time I came, uh, I kept inviting her, calling her, calling her, but she, not, she did not want to talk to me again <laughs> because the whole balloon had been pierced. Right. This whole big thing, oh, rah, rah, had been pierced. So a huge amount of Western literature, the study, the linguistics, the science of linguistics originated from the study of Panini in the 1800s. Every European uh, uh, university to get a PhD in linguistics required you to study Panini's grammar first and then apply it to German or French or something. But over a period of time, they took that grammar and translated and made it their own grammar also. You see. That is called digestion. And then they don't need to study Sanskrit because it's been finished. They don't need it anymore. They've translated it. But for quite a long time, Panini's grammar was the grammar to study in any linguistics in a European university. So if you look at the origin of uh, many of the, you look at uh, the translation of Shakuntala in German and in Europe in general, produced a huge uh, excitement over completely new poetry and how innovative it was. 
So if you look at the Indian influences, some books have been written. I can give you a bibliography. Several books have been written on the Indian influences on European literature, poetry, you know, all that kind of stuff. Some of the famous European poets were deeply immersed into Indian thought. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very interactive conversation. I'll take a 30 second break. There's a small sheet being distributed to you all. The purpose is very simple. Rajivji has a discussion group and a mailing list. He would like to keep you all updated, up, posted up with all the later developments. So he requests that you kindly put your email ID and your name in proper, clear, legible lettering so that his secretary can type it in clear and we <coughs> can reach you and you are still in the loop. Um, yeah, Rajivji, your formulation about Charvaks 2.0 is uh, insightful, Purva Paksha formulation about the opponents. However, if we look at their intent and motivations of these so-called our op opponents, and if we go the full hog, why don't we look at their Asuric, Tamasic, and low Rajasic ideology, and the fact that they are um, Asuric and Tamasic individuals, why don't we call them why don't we call them Asuras instead of Charvaks? Okay. Ch Charvak is a, yeah. See, Charvak is a ideological uh, and, and intellectual uh, premise. Uh, that could be with a good guy or a bad guy, but that's an intellectual premise. Asurik is a kind of a moral judgment and an ethical kind of a position. So, a charva could be an asuric one, could be. But the charva could also be a good one, but who, who happens to believe in that. So I'm giving them that privilege. See, I want to go, give them the benefit of doubt. Then my victory is stronger. If I go and give them and say, I lift you to charva level, they were great scholars. Come on, let's debate on the merits. I'm not looking at your lifestyle. I'm not looking that, you know, you are uh, coming home drunk and you are eating beef. I'm not going to look at that. I'm just saying this is your scholarship. Okay, it is Charvak scholarship, but we are going to debate the merits. And if I can give them a good run for the money based on the merits side, I think it's a better victory. Also, if I call them, my goal is not to change them, but to inspire our people to rise up. If I call them Charvaks, it challenges our people to become better scholars. If I call them Asuric, our people can just uh, accuse them, blame them, uh, you know, put uh, black paint on them, throw eggs at them. Uh, these kind of silly things are people very easy to do and very prone to do. I don't want that because then, then they will not do the serious work I want. So calling, taking your opponent and lifting him to a level of a kind of honor almost, yeah, uh, is very important. If you read the dedication of this book, you read the dedication? Yes, yes, it's dedicated to, to the Purva Paksha. It's dedicated to the Purva Paksha and the Uttar Paksha tradition with gratitude to the Purva Pakshans, the opponents from whom I have learnt. Hoping that we continue this churning and this back and forth with mutual respect. That is the dedication. Because when they first open the book, I don't want to have them dismiss it as, oh, they're attacking us and all. I want to invite them. I want to invite them into conversations and debates. And I'm trying to create a home team of solid intellectuals from the tradition side. Then we invite those guys and we have these debates. Then the victory is much better. We'll also learn things. We should not be like the previous gentleman was saying. We should not be in denial that they have nothing to offer. They're smart guys. They're good people. We'll learn some things from them and we'll teach something from them. And that way we'll become much better. Thank you. Namaste, Rajivji. Um, the Charvak 2.0 insight was very brilliant. One more, one more observation I have is that not only this literature is being produced, that's one part of it, the production is happening, but there is huge appeal among Hindus for this kind of thinking, yeah. which is why it becomes pop culture books <laughs> and a TV series so quickly. So two parts to the question, what, what is your insight on the appeal that Charvak philosophy has in our society today? And two, because of that, they don't want to hear us because they think you're being pedantic. I mean, what, what is the big deal? This is correct, right? Uh, it could have been political, what's wrong with it? So, so how do we subvert it in a, in a society which actually celebrates Charvak thinking? Yeah, so I think, uh, good question. I think that uh, 
uh, we cannot blame them for being better at their ideological marketing than we are. Okay. It is our problem that we are not good enough. So why is our why are our thinkers not able to articulate, be out there, and respond? Why why is it that very few of us are taking this on? I've been doing it for 25 years. I was so sure that all my uh, friends who are done well in the U.S. would support me by now, but they are busy doing their life. They're not interested. I thought, thought that, okay, maybe in India they'll do it, but in India they'll come, they'll clap, they'll buy a couple of books and then nothing happens. I haven't seen the traction. I haven't seen the solid commitment. So if the ones who are in a position to commit with tons of money, they'd rather spend it on politics or something else for themselves. Uh, the ones who are running around wanting quick limelight, they are doing cut paste here and there, just getting ahead. We are not, uh, we, have, we have not produced a generation of tapasvis and serious. So it is the charvaks who are doing the tapasya. Yeah. This is, I tell you, the people I'm criticizing for their ideas, I have a lot of respect for their work ethic. Working very hard. They, they are working very hard. I take a solid piece of work they've done and I give it to several Sanskrit scholars who are recommended very highly. One is a couple in Karnataka here in Bangalore, very smart couple. Then some people in Delhi University, the Sanskrit chair, Sanskrit department chair said these are very smart, they're smartest people. So and I asked others, uh, uh, Sudhi is one of the sponsors. So I asked them, okay, I need to put them on a salary for a few months, you guys should sponsor them. So some of these guys put on small funding for a few weeks or months to see what they can do. And the project is that I'm doing all this. I want it well validated. I want you to independently evaluate what the what is being written in a certain book or something so that we can have a, our own seminar and discuss. Yeah. Now, they come back and say it's too difficult for us to read. Uh, we can't understand it. They're not trained enough to read it. Some of them give up in a few weeks. Uh, the, the dishonest ones make us run around, keep funding them. They want to go to the Mysore library and get some document, then they want funding to go to here, there. After many months of running around, wasting money, they come back saying, sir, we can't do anything. So our work ethic is not there, and the caliber is not there. So what is, this is a problem. This is a, pro a very serious issue we've raised, very seriously. So you can't say that, you know, uh, society has gone into a certain product and not into the other product it's for us to make our product better. We need to understand the market also. We need to quit like that girl, my niece, how I talked to her about this T.S. Eliot and how I talked to this young man. Who, how many people do you know who would talk to an English honors guy and be able to show him evidence that this is the Indian origin of T.S. Eliot? Our people don't know these things. So if I say it to me, the reason I don't talk about it is that it's one of 15 books I'm writing. One of 15 books I'm writing is on the Hindu and Buddhist influences on Western literature. Yeah. So why aren't there people writing all this? Why one man can do all, has to do all this? So I have failed to inspire enough people to join this. And we need a very large number of high quality people to join this. Then we will be producing the TV serials. I've even wondered why I'm available. Why not some TV serial guy talk to me and I'll be an advisor and I'll give them my spin. I never get, they keep talking a little bit here, there, and you have a nice dinner with them. They talk, 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 talk a lot, but it never turns into action. So the fault is also uh, our community's failure to sponsor the right kind of things. Sure. Thank you. It is, the society is being bombarded with products of a certain kind and not enough products of the other kind. But we have had successes, for instance, Ayurveda is successful. Okay, so Baba Ram Dev is making many traditional things successful. That's an example where you can use free market innovatively, bring back our products. So we could do it with ideas also. Not, nobody stopped our people from making our TV series with our values, but they done it with their values, you see? We can't complain. It's nobody stopped us. When I uh, told uh, Sheldon Pollock that uh, you know I'm the first person to write a thorough critique of your work, or somebody so great, you, you, there have to be criti critiques because uh, what makes a thinker great is a lot of people critique him and take many positions, and it, his work becomes more important. And I'm the only person so far who's done such a thorough critique in this book. Why is it that all the traditional people? 
and you go to India and you go so many times and you meet all these people and some may learn then in discussion and what not. How, why is it that none of them have critiqued you? And they're always in awe of you, but they've not critiqued you. You know what he said to me? He said, it's not my fault. They were allowed to do it. I never stopped them. They never did it. Ask them. They're in awe. He's right. It is not his fault that nobody has evaluated him so systematically like I'm doing. He never stopped them. He's saying it. He's saying, ask them. I never stopped it. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. So he then looks at me and says, Rajiv, your real problem is not me, but the traditional Sanskrit scholars. And he's right. They, they are the ones who, who need to wake up. So that's true. Just an addendum to that. So therefore, this intellectual Kshatriya, speaking, the yeah. intellectual Kshatriya agenda that you're setting out, it's part of the agenda also, therefore, to do a poor paksha, not of the of production course. side, but of the consumer side. Yes. And see how we can package our ideas better. Absolutely. And uh, consumer side and the Hindu pseudo-intellectual. Right. There's a lot of Hindu pseudo-intellectuals. Right. We do talk about uh, secular pseudo-intellectuals, but there's a lot of Hindu pseudo-intellectuals who are not qualified, who are not putting the tapasya. They really are there just to make quick limelight for themselves. Sure. This is very da bad for us because they, they don't even know who to support. I find our Hindu guys parading some, some of these Western scholars around and parading them because those guys know how to win us over with few nice statements. Yeah. They can say a few nice, beautiful things and everybody's so happy that we never look beneath the surface. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Arun and my question is regarding the temples. Okay, so a temple from being a place of science and art today has become a place of believers and an old man's place. So and the? old man's place. Okay. okay, so a guy who is... But young people also go to become, uh, pass the exam and so on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, would, I would say a temple has been reduced to transactional Hinduism. Hinduism as a transaction with God. I'll do this, sir, please do that for me. In Delhi, if you want to fix your tax return or you have problem with some government, you get a CA and his job is to be a fixer. He's basically a fixer who will take some money from you, process it on some bribe, keep it for himself, and he'll fix some deal. That's what Indian CAs sometimes do, I'm told. And so this temple is also a kind of fixer to, like a broker, of a transaction to pass my daughter exam and solve this problem for me and like that. That is what bhakti has turned into, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so let me finish the question, sir. Um, for me, when I go to a temple, I see a lot of science there, right from the kind of trees and plants to its geographical location, to its kind of architecture. And every temple differs in its geographical architecture. There is so much of science, but uh, when a guy is talented enough to break the belief of a believer, we've lost a man. He either becomes an intellectual nomad or he turns conversion something else. And um, <coughs> that's a very serious problem. When we lose this temple institution from our culture, we're going to be a bunch of intellectual nomads. How to deal with that situation? So uh, it's a very in, uh, good, absolutely valid thing. Temples were center of learning, center of arts, center of science, and not just a center of bhakti to do a transaction. Today it has become just like that. So this is, historically we can blame history and say, okay, those guys burned temples, destroyed, money went away, it went to government, whatever. We can blame it. But I think we have to take responsibility what we do about it now. So question is where some guys want to set up chair in Columbia University, give him so many millions of dollars. The question should be asked to them. That's not going to promote Indian culture. That's feeding the other side. It's called feeding the crocodile. It's like you feed the crocodile, he'll become like a pet dog. He'll be like that, that kind of a stupid attitude. You cannot feed a crocodile and turn him into a friend because that's his DNA. So feeding the Western Indologists with money and chairs is a wrong strategy. A lot of our people are doing it because they will become important in the good books of the West. It will be good for their publicity, their personal prestige and their networking, maybe business or something. So a lot of Indians are now in the fashion of going around setting up funding chairs for Western Indologists to get even more money and power, which is a stupid thing to do. So the question should be, why not channel that money into useful things here in India? 
the revival of Indology, revival of Sanskriti has to happen in the home base, home soil, and then we can export it. It cannot be done somewhere else because that will never work. So they're, they're not invested in the same way. They are invested in some other civilization. So it has to happen here in India on Indian soil by Indian people. So the kind of revival of temples is, an, is one instance of a bigger revival. And it requires sponsorship by the, by the rich people who understand that taking your money somewhere else and investing is a bad idea. You should bring it here and start these. So why don't, why don't the rich guys in Bangalore put together some funding and create a really multifaceted temple where there is all this learning also going on? Why not? I mean, this is something you have to push our people. I cannot do these things because I just don't have the resources, you know. But uh, th you're absolutely correct. This is what ought to happen. The temples in the U.S., Hindu temples, I'm very sorry to tell you this, but the Hindu temples are a cash machine. They make tons of money. People come and give, give, give money. Okay, temple. So the trustees of the temple can do whatever they want with the money and it's tax-free. Tax-free, not tax on the temple. And most of them, you don't even know really how much money is collected and how much is declared. Once I was in a, uh, I won't name anybody because I don't want to get them in trouble. But once I was giving a talk, it was a hall in the temple. And I was giving a talk and I went to the restroom and then I lost my way, I don't know, you know. So I didn't know, I just moved around, made a wrong turn. So I entered a room by mistake and there was a pile of currency notes like that, pile on the ground, wet on a white sheet and seven or eight men sitting around counting these notes. Huge amount of money, I don't know how much it was. Later I said, what is all this? I asked somebody, he says, oh, every week these guys come, they're trustees, they divide it up. That's a very sad thing. So it's a, it's a money generator, business, because huge amount of money goes. The consumer has given it to the deity, but these guys do whatever they want. There's no accounting for it. So in this uh, Hindu Mandir Executive Committee, which is an organization in US to organize all the temples. I think BHP has started that. So once or twice they called me to be the speaker. Then they stopped calling me because I said some things. Like I said, we should have an ISO standard type of how to run temples. And one of the things should be, you should have a lock box. Lock box means there is a bank gives you a box. The donation goes into that. There's a lock, only the bank can open. You don't open it, you take it to the bank, they count the money, put it into the deposit, into your account. Nobody gets to touch the cash. I said that should be an ISO standard. Nobody in the temple is going to touch the cash. All the cash goes into the box, bank only takes it. You know what? They didn't call me back. <laughs> this is our own people, sir. You can keep feeding them, Sonia Gandhi is bad. Oh, whoa, whoa, great, we should have uh, so and so go to jail, we'll, uh, this guy did it, that guy did it, everybody come, hall is full, 10 times big. Be but you know, tell them that now you have to change, you have to change, you have to take some action, you got to do your tapasya, clean up your act. They don't want you back, they don't want such a speaker because you know, he's not making us feel good. I am always accused that you, sir, but uh, you're not making me feel good. So I'd say, okay, I'm not Shahrukh Khan or something. <laughs> you know, this is, that's the problem. So what you're asking for requires, uh, you know, requires people who are willing to make the sacrifice and create that kind of a infrastructure that you're looking for. It is not quick, it will not be easy, it will take a long time and we will make mistakes but then we'll get it right, but it has to be done. So good that you're thinking like that. My question is uh, related to my observation in the society. Uh, long time back, I was after long time back, I was in my village uh, last year, and uh, we celebrate Durga Puja very cel very traditionally in our villages in Bihar, in the Mithila part, basically Sakt Bihar. So previously, in my childhood, I have seen Ramlilas being organized, Natak will be there like that, but uh, this time just in front of the Durga pan Pandal, 
there is a stage and uh, we three brothers went together we saw we thought that let uh, it's an orchestra so let's watch it and uh, we could not watch it together it was so obscene so why why this kind of change is happening so it's <coughs> bollywood also a part of the nexus that you quite often talk about and uh, second pro question is also related to spirituality all only uh, recently i was little upset and i was taking name of lord ram it was some some dhun so the person with me he was a friend of mine he suddenly stopped me why are you taking only half a name you should chant complete certain mantra which the ram naam is a part of that why are you doing it like that and i was just stunned how can he stop me like that is some kind of fanaticism entering and it is very popular branch of uh, which is kind of very aggressively uh, uh, propagating bhakti and uh, he belong to that thing and he told you you should chant complete uh, this particular maha mantra because it is a maha mantra so where are we heading and well the second one you know uh, somebody is passionate about his sampradaya and his tradition and he feels you should do it uh you have a right to say i don't want to do it i mean that's not a big problem because you know people also get very passionate and whatever works for them they want to expand it and get others to do it it's silly it's uh, in insecurity but being it's, aggressive about it yeah so you should you can just turn him off and say you know that's good for you i respect that but mm. this way i am i'm not going to change because you told me so and it's not a question of your logic and all this is what i works for me you know you have to be very assertive mm. the first one i think is more dangerous that is that the the breakdown of society even religious society is kind of becoming very uh, kind of degraded you, that's your point you know i'm seeing that all over the place i'm seeing that uh, hinduism is just a transaction to resolve some problem for a moment and then you're done back to the normal life you know that's how it is and our own people are making uh, i fully agree with you when i was a kid we used to celebrate ram leela everybody had a role to play we spent a month doing all kind of things you know and it was really exciting you know it's gone it's gone uh, tv we sit and watch it on tv <laughs> so it's not my performance it is like i'm watching as a consumer they are performing it used to be we are performing it is not uh, it is a participatory thing it is not a spectator thing now it's become a spectator thing we used to perform all of us all kids used to get some role you know so uh, this is uh, uh, you know kind of this is what's killing hinduism more than any other corruption i mean any conversion and all we blame others but you know we are not from within sufficiently loyal to us to our own tradition so this is a matter of it's a very personal thing you know no one has told me to be do this much tapasya it just comes natural to me and uh, i cannot teach this to others i cannot convince others i can argue with them and they not call me back but really the solution is you have to start being the tapasvi yourself you have to be the tapasvi yourself when you are so sincere people will watch some people will get influenced some will not bother you can't change it society as such society as a whole largely follows role models you know they get role models from movies and the politicians and what not and and depending on what they see they, it influences young people so this degraded pop culture a, a vulgarity kind of a thing has become the, the big popular stuff that goes on in our culture mm -hmm. ramayan and the itihas and the natak used to be our pop culture that was our pop culture popular culture if you think of pop culture as popular culture that was our popular culture for the masses very sophisticated very clean very satvik nice but that has changed now it is very sad and it's good that you're pointing it out you should go wherever you get a chance you should talk like that because more people will reflect otherwise they're all very chauvinistic are we doing so well we are uh, 800 million hindus but come on how many of them are really practicing hindus bala thank you Uh, Rajiv ji namaste my Hi. name is Shashikant Joshi 
and uh, from 90 to 2007, I was in US and then came back to India and Bangalore. I have a practical Sanskrit uh, Facebook page. And uh, the reason I'm giving the background is I get a lot of uh, questions on that page saying that how do I read the Vedas? And what I tell them is that you know, that's a you know, very long <coughs> journey, but why don't you start with something like a Hitopadesh or a Panchatantra or any of the stories uh, that give some wisdom. Uh, the question slash suggestion I have for you is that I have read a lot of your work online and I do have the patience to read that. What I find is that just like the Vedas and the Upanishads were not meant for everybody, it was a very <coughs> select audience who could have the, uh, the aptitude, time and ability to understand that and that's why we have the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and all the Puranas that are written for the common people to digest the wisdom through stories. So what you are writing is great but it is it is only for a very few people to be able to handle. Do you have, or should you have, another side of that where that, that dense wisdom, that, that academic argumentation is br broken down into smaller pieces? There are a lot of people who are good at it. I've even tried them, they need funding. Uh, we will start this project, we dedicate it to you, and we will have uh, each one of my books turned into smaller pieces. I've already got the organization. It's obvious, such an obvious thing. Even my publisher said that this book is five books. Okay, so I will get this done. You must now write us a big check. <laughs> I'll connect with you afterwards. Huh? Yeah, I'll connect with you afterwards. No, no, but I'm saying that we need the help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of resources. Sure. It's a matter, uh, you could also say, why don't I make documentaries? I'll say, good, we'll go to get documentary guy, write me a check, we'll get documentary made. We will do all, why don't we turn into nataks and drama, good, write me a third check. <laughs> sure. Just big enough checkbook. <laughs> That's all. You, it's basically resources. It's basically something like that. It's resources. So would I be better off writing just one book and then just keep making it simpler, turning it into simpler things? Wait, wait, check. let me finish my point. When I have 15 more books left in the pipeline that I have to work on, which are far more difficult for ordinary people to do and I am good at it and I've already done the research. And if I don't publish that work, it will be dead, it will be gone, no, it may take a long time, maybe generations before somebody else does repeats all that research. I have a huge archive of very original things that I've ca gathered that need to be put together and put, turned into books. I have 15 books in different stages to be done. So my decision is that is more difficult to do than what you suggested, which takes my old book and make it simpler. It is more necessary to do, it is more big impact to do. I'm the guy who knows how to do it, I'm almost done. I can start producing one book a year if I get some help, you know. Uh, I'm better off with whatever life I have to do as much of that as I can finish. And this other job, you should do. You should put a team together, take one of my books, get a team, I'll help you, I'll guide, but I cannot put my time into that. I need partners like you who are passionate, who understand, and who are willing to take the lead. I really would like that. So my intention was not for you to write them. My okay. intention for you to, uh, when you're asking for intellectual kshatriyas, you mm -hmm. can also uh, encourage people to do this yes. work, the of second course. level work, of course. to disseminate in more people. And in my e-group, we produced many such projects. The, the ratio of initial enthusiasm Later, uh, actually showing up to do anything. Later, producing something. Later, producing the final thing. It is horrible, the ratio. We got people who keep talking, yeah, we volunteer for everything. All kind of projects I have. So, you know, I can make more enemies by criticizing them. I already got enough enemies. <laughs> so I don't want to criticize them and say, why you ran away, what you did. A lot of people are upset because I call the bluff. And then they turn into opponents and they start making all kind of problems for me. Sure. So I simply turn down the offers. Most proposals I get, if I say, uh, you know, I had this boss in uh, Fortune 20 company. I was in my 20s. And my job was international new business development for a huge corp giant, you know, at a very young age. So I was going around the world. British Telecom wanted my ideas, Japan guys, this guy would fly around, the company was flying me around to do these collaborations. Wherever I would go, I had full of creative ideas. 
and they would want, okay, more proposal, give us more detail like that. And I would keep feeding them more details with all these innovative ideas and tell my boss very excited, oh, we've got this guy, company, big company interested, that company interested, chairman of this guy, this one they were. So he one day asked me that, look, you've been here doing this for all these months, but you haven't closed even one deal. We all talk. So he was like my father's age. So I said, uh, okay. He said, because they're getting free consulting from you, all these guys. You're a smart guy, very easy to get you talking. You're giving them a lot of knowledge, and they're getting your knowledge. They keep pumping you, come back and give us more. And you think they'll do a deal? They're not going to do a deal. So he said, I'll tell you what you should do. Uh, he says, okay, give me this one example. Uh, it was uh, back in the 80s. This company is supposed to put $100 million towards this venture, correct? I said, yeah. So 0.1% will be $100,000. So you write to them that for me to come and do the next level of discussion, you put $100,000 deposit. If we finish this deal, if the deal happens in the next 90 days, it will apply towards your investment. If it doesn't, then we will keep it as our expense. He says 90% of your list of 50 ventures you are talking about will disappear when you make them perform a little bit. He was right. Out of my 30, 40 companies, there were different stages of excitement. Hardly two were left that were willing to take the first step. Okay. So I use this idea now. When somebody comes to me, I give them a little bit they have to do. Little bit. 98, 99% of them I never hear back. And it doesn't have to be money. It has to be just effort. Like they say, sir, can I translate your such and such book into, uh, you know, uh, such and such language? Telugu. Telugu is the most favorite language for people to propose that we should do. I don't have a single Telugu book done. I've had maybe a hundred people suggesting this. I always write back to them saying, give me a proposal, how long it will take, what will be the funding, where will you get the funding from, who will do it, what is his prior background, what are the milestones, and give me some references of previous work they've done. I'll show it to my Telugu friends, and let, let's do it professionally. Nine out of them, they never even have come back with that. How are they going to have done the work? if they cannot even put that two page together. So it is all baloney, just talk, you see. So I have so many projects, I don't have lack of imagination. I can write you uh, lots of volumes of all kind of projects we should do. And many, many people th thoroughly jump in and to do it also, willing to do it, but they're not producing real deal. So that's our problem. Thank you, sir. We cannot do it with volunteers. We need paid people. Because volunteer attitude is, I'm doing you a favor, yeah, you don't want it, what do you mean I didn't show up, I, you, I, I'm, not, I'm a volunteer. So volunteer has got this arrogance that I don't have to produce, I'm not accountable. Whereas a paid person is accountable, at least you can tell him that I'm paying you, this is the agreement, you have to work. So that requires funding. <coughs> all the Christian missionaries, they're paid. They're paid, yes. Yeah. All, the, all these communists, like leftists and all that, they get this Ford Foundation, all these guys giving them grants, these NGOs are like the left-wing evangelism. There is right-wing evangelism, Christian. There is left-wing evangelism through the NGOs. All of them are on the payrolls. Yes. So if you can fund, I will get very smart people. Thank and you. we will give you a quarterly report. <laughs> you will be very proud. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Pankaj. Uh, yeah. Good evening, sir. So my question is, like, recently there is a controversy regarding Sabrimala temple that uh, women between the age of 10 and 40 are not allowed in the temple because of, uh, you know, reason being they are impure and so on. And um, so what this, the narrative which was postulated basically was that, you know, th this kind of custom and kind of tradition is very regressive and oppressive and discriminatory. So uh, my question is like, with contemporary, you know, keeping contemporary morals and ethics in mind, can we even justify this kind of a tradition and uh, it's a good if, point. And no, how do we, we do it? We, but our smritis, this is why this tradition is not a shruti, this tradition is a smriti. Smriti can be modified, right? So with the times, as times change, as needs change, we have to be able to reevaluate it. And maybe it doesn't make sense to do this. And we should be smart enough, we should be brave enough to say, let's bring the different people together. There shouldn't be violence and anger and you don't need police there. We, you should have smart people who understand the tradition, somebody who understand the history of that particular temple, why it happened, where it happened from, what is their logic, what is their basis, to see if we can have an amicable solution without external intervention. 
So the, the, the insiders need to also be flexible to discuss issues openly. And uh, the outsiders need to be kept out because it's none of their business. So I'm not, I'm not saying that we should freeze the system and never change it. I just don't want interference. Pranam Sadevji, uh, this question is in continuation with the previous one. Uh, where does liberalism fit in the idea or narrative of Indology? Uh, our society is liberal in nature, uh, though uh, uh, my context is we have Sadhu saying the girl should not wear jeans. So that is not my hin Hindu history. We were liberal in all our th thoughts, right? So what is, how do we perceive the idea of liberalism for current context? So the word liberal uh, is misused because anybody can start, anybody can start calling himself liberal. Uh, uh, like when George Bush attacked Iraq, it was called Operation Desert Freedom. <laughs> ah, desert Freedom. I mean, it's like uh, Sheldon Pollock's uh, liberation philology. We're liberating you. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a sham, these, the way these words get appropriated, these powerful words, people appropriate humanism, liberal, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I don't know what you mean by liberalism because uh, to me, uh, the Sanskrit tradition is highly liberating. In fact, the byline of my book is, is Sanskrit political or sacred? Because that's one debate. Oppressive or liberating? That's a debate. Dead or alive? These are the three questions answered in this book, discussed in this book. So I consider our tradition to be liberating. I do not consider it to be oppressive. They consider it to be oppressive and they want to liberate us from this tradition. So the debate is over what constitutes liberation and liberation from what? So liberation is from bondage. So it depends on what is your bondage? What are you in bondage to that you need liberation? So that's the debate. What is the human condition? from which you want liberation. So there is material level, you know, you want liberation from poverty. You, there is liberation from the bondage of, uh, you know, uh, kind of oppress, oppression, social oppression, injustice, you want liberation from that. There's also liberation from the ego. There's a bondage to the ego, which, which makes you go running around and until you are dead, you're basically a slave of it. That is also a, a bondage. So there's different levels of bondage. There is different levels of liberation. So that's, and our tradition discusses all of this. It is not just moksha. We have become moksha-centric. A lot of the Hindus have become too moksha-centric. But there is also arth, there is also kam, there is also, you know, there's different uh, kinds of pursuits that are legitimate. And there's nothing wrong in pursuing all these in balance, as long as you do it in balance. So liberation also has many facets to it. It's a big subject. What is, li what is Hindu liberation? What is the Hindu model for liberation is a very large subject. It is not just one little thing. Even, you know, I would say the ISIS is probably saying they're liberal. <laughs> because they'll say we liberate the world from kafirs. Yeah, we liberate the world. Because their definition of the problem is such that they are solving that the problem as they define it. So everybody thinks that their ideology requires them to do whatever they're doing because they're liberating us from that particular problem which their ide ide ideology sees. So that's the thing. Yeah. I think it's a very, very interesting session for the one reason that we're supposed to have an interactive conversation with Rajivji. And each of those questions were so very meaningful, so very Very nice. interesting. I really and, enjoyed it. And so very harmonious in the flow. It's not like people come and then have a egoistic challenge with Rajivji. No, it is a learning occasion and a very and interactive know, we, we, we ask so many questions people ask. It requires funding, it requires support, it requires sponsorship, and you need people who got the right heart, the right swabhav, the right swadharma. And so we, we need community leaders who understand these issues and who want to support us. And Murli is definitely one of them. So please, thank you. Good evening, friends. First of all, my apology for uh, coming late. Any excuse is not acceptable. I don't believe in that. The second one, I must be honest that I've been uh, reading all the books of Rajiv Malhotra except this book yet. So <laughs> I must uh, be honest about it. That's why I asked Mohan uh, 
probably it's better I don't speak. Then he said, Novinna, you come and uh, I wanted to ask a couple of questions to Rajiv. Today, I mean, Prime Minister has uh, probably declared today is uh, a startup, startup capital uh, for this country. Uh, I don't know whether he has announced as a startup capital day and he has, I believe he has announced about 10,000 crore of uh, capital to support startup capital is one. On the other hand, uh, I've been interacting with a lot of uh, NRIs uh, other than Rajiv. So <laughs> currently what is happening now in uh, particularly uh, the community who are uh, living, Indian community who are living in US, big change. They carry this DNA of Indian DNA. They have the best of ambience and environment to prove whatever uh, they could. Uh, today, you know, I mean, Microsoft and Google, uh, Indians uh, are heading Microsoft and Google. Probably there is a prediction in the next uh, five to seven years' time, all the MNCs will be controlled by Indian, uh, Indian born uh, uh, Americans. That's a situation. I don't see a big problem in uh, supporting these kind of uh, initiatives. Probably this is one, you know, I mean, uh, Indian companies are headed by uh, uh, <coughs> Indian born Americans at this point of time. Probably the new science and technology, the next phase, probably in the next uh, 10 years time, the new science and technology invention could happen from Indian uh, Vedic principles. Probably most of which could come from Rajiv's books. People who read uh, Rajiv's books, probably most of which could come is my view. Probably I am uh, started working on uh, explaining to a uh, lot of NRA friends, please read Rajiv's books probably you could uh, hit a fortune in the next uh, two years, five years, seven years time when things are uh, getting much better and better. Probably one is startup capital, which is very, very important today. Probably there should be a capital setup to invent lot many things which are hidden today, which Rajiv is uh, struggling very hard to get this out. Of course, very few people like us uh, support, but as a government, in fact, uh, I was thinking after going through the startup capital uh, story today, I wanted to write a letter to Modi today, send a mail to Modi today, stating that this kind of initiatives, there has to be a capital allocated. It's not government is going to give solution to everything, but government initiatives will uh, probably provoke lot many people to come forward to support. Probably, uh, I mean, uh, I hope I'll be successful in getting this. I'm going to ask him to set up about 100 crores only so that Another 10,000 crores can come from various people like me or you know, people like uh, who are sitting here to support this. Very so good. that's my, I'm going to write a mail today. So far he has been responding whatever my mail I've been sending. Hopefully this also Very should good. be here. Very good. That is my view. I would only request everyone to support Raji's mission. He has taken up phenomena very, very strongly. And uh, the way, I mean, everyone can communicate, the way Rajiv can communicate is something outstanding. When he communicates something with, I mean, all the Western world, looks for authenticity. 